Good morning. It's Friday morning. Tonight we go to Joplin to the Souls Harbor Mission. I'm looking forward to that. It's only one day or month, but I, if I lived closer, I'd go a lot more often. I'm glad that we have the opportunity to go. There's always a good bunch there. It seems like when towns are on the state line, they got a lot of homeless people. I have a theory about that, that they're so close to the state line, they get confused about where they ought to live. <laughs> but uh, there's no scientific evidence <laughs> to support that. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, we finished up chapter 51, no, chapter 50 of Jeremiah yesterday. And we're going to begin now in chapter 51. And it's a judgment of, on Babylon by God that's so severe that there's nothing left. Well, there's not much there now, but it didn't come from the wrath of God, and it didn't come from destruction, and it didn't come from being conquered. It may have atrophied over time, but there's still people there, and it's not uninhabitable, and it's not desolate. And there are people there every day. And there are tourists there every day. There are nomads there every day. There are herdsmen there every day. There are scientific expeditions there every day. For a long time, and during the Iraqi war, the second Iraqi war, there were uh, American military personnel stationed there all the time. So this great final judgment on Babylon has not happened yet. and It will be made clear to you after we get through with chapter 50. Now after we're through with, with, with Jeremiah completely, I'm going to do an add-in. I'm going to do an extra program incorporating Mark, uh, Isaiah chapters 13 and 14. Jeremiah chapters 50, 51, and Revelation chapter 17 and 18. And that is how we get the whole picture of the future destruction of Babylon, which is Babylon the Great, Mystery Babylon, that great whore, that harlot, that mother of harlots, the woman that rides the beast. See, it all goes back to Babylon. It's all Babylon. Where all false religion comes from. It's where all devil worship comes from. It's where child sacrifice comes from. Never forget that destruction always comes from God with his covenant people. Wrath always comes like this. Because the three things that people do until there's no remedy. They go whoring after other gods. They sacrifice their children. And they believe the lies of false prophets, which should make every American cringe and make every American Christian cringe, but with hope, because you belong to Jesus Christ and your life is in his hands, not in the devil's, not in the world's, not in the government's. Your life is in the hands of Jesus Christ. And he and he alone has sovereignty over you. He is your Lord, your master, your king. Whatever he decides is what you do. Or at least what happens to you. It should be that whatever he decides is what we do, but we don't always let that happen, do we? Chapter 51 of the book of Jeremiah. I'm again trying to get used to this new Bible that the evangelist Ed Held gave me. I like it very much. But the print is a little big, but my eyes are real weak in the morning, and I can see it a little better in the morning. And then late at night, they're tired, and I can see it better. During the day, it's like a bit, I, don't, I can't seem to get it at an angle where I can read it. But since I do most of my reading early in the morning and late at night, it really doesn't matter, do it? <laughs> Chapter 51 of the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon 
and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me. There was nobody in Babylon, uh, nobody rising up against Babylon in those days, except for the Medes and the Persians. A destroying wind. And I will send into Babylon fanners, and they shall fan her, and shall empty her land, for all the, in the day of trouble they shall be against her round about. You see a lot of fire in the city. People are going to fan it. You know, it's going to cause trouble. It's going to be a fight, and everybody's going to move in and destroy Babylon. That had not happened yet, as I keep repeating to you. The Medes and the Persians took Babylon without a battle. They snuck in, killed Belshazzar, took the city. Excuse me. I'm sorry. A little hard to, to breathe this morning. Um, then they took the city. Then... When Alexander came, he defeated the Persians in the field. And then when he, by the time he got to Babylon, he was welcomed with, all, with open army. He came into Babylon as the conquering hero. He didn't fight a war there. Babylon was not surrounded. Babylon was not destroyed. Her walls were not thrown down. Her city was not burned. No, it didn't work like that. That's not what happened. And like... I say Rome gave up before they got there. They just decided Babylon was too much trouble they didn't want it. By the time the Romans were in charge of things. And against him that bendeth, let the archer bend his bow, and against him that lifted himself up his lifted himself up in his brigandine, and spare ye not her young men, destroy ye utterly all her hosts. Babylon has never been conquered, a battle has not been fought there, and nobody was destroyed. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and they that are thrust through in her streets. Hadn't happened. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. When Jeremiah writes this, the Assyrians had taken Israel and scattered Israel and occupied Israel, the northern kingdom, whose capital was Samaria. That happened in 732 B.C. Jeremiah is writing this in 600 B.C. This part right here. So, there's nobody in Judah I mean, there's nobody in Israel. Israel had indeed been forsaken. For then, Judah is under, is fixing to be under siege by Nebuchadnezzar. The puppet king Zedekiah sits on the throne. And uh, the only thing that's true is that both of their lands were filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel and against the Lord say that about the United States were full of sin, filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Flee out of the midst of Babylon, deliver every man his soul. In other words, if you run, you can be saved. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. That day has not come. It talks about the day of the Lord, the day of Jacob's trouble in the latter days of speech. He'll stand upon the Mount of Olives. He's talking about the battle of Armageddon. That is the day of the Lord's vengeance. The wrath of God is poured out upon the earth for seven years from the time of the confirming of the covenant between Antichrist and Israel to the, the Antichrist setting himself up as God in the temple, which will be rebuilt, and uh, and sacrificing a pig on the altar, and then declaring himself as God and sitting in the temple of God, just like he is to God, and then God protecting the remnant of the Jews for three and a half years in the area of what is now Jordan.
That is the day of his vengeance. Uh, now, the earth has not suffered his vengeance yet. The day of the Lord has not yet come. It will come. It's coming soon. You need to be ready. It says that he will render unto her a recompense. He'll pay her back. He not paid her back yet. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations are drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Yeah, Babylon had the golden cup. God told Jeremiah, I have made Nebuchadnezzar a king of kings, and he's going to do my will. He came out, he conquered the Assyrians. He conquered all the other little countries. He conquered Egypt. That was the last world empire in his way. The Medes and the Persians had not yet risen to power. Babylon had the golden cup. They had a lot of golden cups that they stole from the temple in Israel, in Judah, in uh, Judah, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, the temple, the house of the Lord. They had a lot of golden cups from there. After they burned it down and carried away all the treasure to Babylon. He made all the earth drunken. The cup of Babylon had made all the earth drunken. How? Because Babylon is Babel. Therefore are the nations mad. The nations are drunken of her wine. From that golden cup of Babylon. So what you need to understand is they settled in the plain of Shinar when they got off the ark. And Nimrod was a mighty hunter in the earth. And he got a name for himself and he decided he was going to build a kingdom for him and his people. They were going to build a tower that would reach up to heaven. They remember that the earth was flooded because it's only a couple of generations back and so on the plain of Shinar Nimrod built Babel a tower that would reach up to heaven and uh, with the memory of the flood ingrained upon them generation to generation until then. It wasn't that far back behind them, see. Their first intent was to build a tower that would reach up to heaven, meaning that it would be tall enough that if the flood came again, that they could climb up there and not drown. <laughs> Good luck. Of course, God thwarted their effort. But the world has always followed Babel. They're going to build their empire. Men will build their empire. Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Cyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, Napoleon, Hitler. And now the Iranians. They're not going to be happy until they kill every Christian and Jew and then also kill every Muslim who doesn't agree with their brand of devil worship. Because they worship Allah who is the devil, the moon god, the yang of the yin. So, Babylon is everything. It goes up through Jezebel. Bel is the Babylonian word for Baal. Their god that they sacrifice to. The fertility god. 
Satan behind him. The nations are mad because they're drunk on Babylon. Babel, Jezebel, the Assyrians, Babylon. The Assyrians came out of Babel too. Their capital was Nineveh. Nineveh is above the plain of Shinar. Between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. So when Nebuchadnezzar's grandfather took Nineveh, he didn't have far to march his army. They're very close between the two rivers. Cradle of civilization, Mesopotamia, Sumeria, whatever you want to call it. It all goes back to battle. And then yet in the future, where the world world is drunk with battle, devil worship. You worship the world. You worship the things that are in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It's all of the world. It's all Babylon. Because that's where false religion started. And that's where they, it will end. Remember, in the last chapter, it says they are mad upon their idols. They're filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Babylon has suddenly fallen and destroyed. Eight. It suddenly fell one time in 539 B.C. But it was not destroyed. That means this is yet future. And you're going to say, oh, well, you know, the, the prophet got it wrong. Well, if the prophet got it wrong, God got it wrong. Because this is God's word. This is not a book that was written by men who just made it up. It was written by 40 men over a period of about 2,100 years. And it says exactly the same thing no matter where you turn. There is one topic and only one, and that is salvation. There is one central character and only one. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything derives from that and from him, redemption and the redeemer. Babylon has suddenly fallen and destroyed. It has not been destroyed. It will be destroyed. In this chapter, in those chapters I've mentioned and I've said, and in Revelation, it will be destroyed, but it hasn't been destroyed yet. How for her, take balm for her pain, if so be she may be healed. Remember Jeremiah's cry, chapter 8. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there any way to heal us? The harvest is past, the summer is ended. And we are not saved. Oh, thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his kindness. Thank God for his long suffering and patience. Or none of us would be here. Babylon has suddenly fallen and destroyed. How for her take balm for her pain if so be she may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her, and let us go every one into his own country, for her judgment reacheth unto heaven, and is lifted up even to the skies. That didn't happen. The people didn't flee Babylon. Remember, the Medes and Persians took it without a fight. The only people who died were the leaders. Belshazzar, his court, a few generals had their throats cut on the steps of the king's palace but Babylon was taken without a fight Alexander took Babylon without a fight they welcomed him with open arms this destruction has never happened yet the 
the people did not forsake her and run away. Yet, her judgment has not reached up to heaven yet. It is not lifted up to the skies yet. It will happen. Make bright the arrows. Gather the shields. The Lord hath raised up the spirit of the king of the Medes. See, now he's dealing prophetically with what's going to happen. 60 years after he's writing this. And it did happen. The Lord hath raised up the spirit of the king of the Medes for his devices against Babylon to destroy it because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. Jeremiah wrote this before the temple was destroyed in, in Judah, in Jerusalem. The Medes would rise up and at first they would be the leaders. They struck an alliance with the Persians. Cyrus the first it would become King Cyrus the first was their great general. Darius the Mede was the first king. And he sat on the throne in Babylon, but he took it without a battle. They did not destroy Babylon. The vengeance of the Lord was not poured down on Babylon. And the vengeance of his temple has not been uh, felt yet by anyone. Set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong. Set up the watchmen. Prepare for ambushes. For the Lord hath both devised and done that which he spake against the inhabitants of Babylon. This didn't happen. The king was drunk. And all of his men were drunk. And they were having a party while they partied and slept. The Medes and the Persians came in on the water course that they had blocked off and, and, and the, they walked in on the riverbed and took the city without a fight in 539 BC. That was how it happened. So that this uh, destruction, this ambushes, this being on guard, it hadn't happened yet. They weren't on guard. They didn't set any watchmen. They didn't expect a thing. Belshazzar had his head cut off, had his throat cut the next morning. Taken in a night, O oh, thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant in treasures, thine end is come, and the measure of thy covetousness. Babylon was well watered by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. At that time, you could go all the way to the Persian Gulf on the Euphrates River. They say that you can't do that now because it's drying up. Matter of fact, that's a fulfillment of prophecy too because there will come a time when the Euphrates River is dry and the kings of Beasts will pass over it on their way to Jerusalem to fight against the Antichrist and his armies. See, not everybody is in favor of the Antichrist. Thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant in treasures, thy end is come, and the measures of thy covetousness. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, saying, Surely I will fill thee with men as with caterpillars, and they shall lift up a shout against thee. That hasn't happened yet. He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and has stretched out the heaven by his understanding. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. And he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. I have heard him twice in my life. When I was twelve, is when I got saved. All he did was call my name, and I'm the only one who heard him. I was sitting on the pew, the chapel in Vacation Bible School, and he said, James. I turned around and looked at everybody, and everybody's head was bowed. Every eye was closed. Even the preacher, his head was bowed, and his eyes were closed. So I couldn't figure out who was talking to me. And nobody else had heard him either. And so I just sat there a while longer. And then the voice came again in my head. James. 
and it sounded like many waters, like the rush of many waters. It was loud, and it was only in my head, but it came from every direction at once. And I heard him again when I was 19 years old, and I, I was reading in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah on Mount Carmel. And I was reading verse 30, where it says that, And Elijah called all the people to come near unto him, and they came near unto him. And Elijah knelt and repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. When I saw this verse, all the other verses went fuzzy, and just that one verse stood out in bold print on very white paper. And everything else was out of focus, and all I could see was that one verse, just like there was a spotlight shining on it. I thought something was wrong with my eyes. I didn't want to wear glasses yet. And uh, I heard that voice again. I recognized it from when I was 12. It was in my head, but it seemed to come from every direction at once, and it did sound like the multitude of waters, the rushing of many waters. And it says, James, go repair my altar. Man, that was, that was 50 years ago. Can you dig it, baby? 50 years ago I heard that. I haven't heard his voice since. Maybe it's because I haven't done my job, my complete job, I haven't completed the task he gave me the first time. Why should he tell me anything else if I haven't done everything he told me to do the last time he talked to me? I might consider that. Of course, everything he needs to say is right here. I'm sure he only spoke to me because that was the only way he could get my attention. Most of the time, he just talks to me through this. He speaks in my head. When he uttereth his voice, there is the multitude of waters in the heavens. And he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Every man is brutish by his knowledge, by his own knowledge. And compared to the Lord, it is brutish. Every founder is confounded by the graven image for his molten image is false, a falsehood. And there's no breath in it. Talking about these gods that people make, they're not alive, they're not living, they're not gods, they're just things. Of course, behind these images and these statues and these icons that they make are multitudes of devils that... Uh, will do anything to keep you looking at them instead of at the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll make you think that, you, that they're the ones responsible for your crops growing, for your good harvest, for your livestock yield, for the rain. Sometimes you got to sacrifice a child or two, you know, to keep that thing going. you got to kill them babies. That's the way they did it then. And that's the way we do it now. We destroy our children. They are vanity, these gods. The work of errors. See, it takes a confused mind to build a god. And a man who was created in God's image decides to create God in his image. And can't even come close. You can't even make, a man can't even make an image that's as good as he is, much less an image of God. They are vanity, the work of errors, in the time of their visitation they shall perish. That visitation has not happened yet. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. As Jeremiah writes this, a puppet king sits on the throne in Judah. 
as Jeremiah writes this, Israel has been in captivity to the Assyrians 132 years before. So there's not a portion, and there's not an inheritance. This has got to be future, you see. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee I will break in pieces the nations, and with thee I will destroy kingdoms. With thee. With Israel. Who's in captivity then? With Judah, who has a puppet king and will be destroyed as Israel was and taken into captivity by the Chaldeans. I'm not talking about them. He could be talking about the Israel that is coming back into the land now where more than half of the world's Jews are now. When they went from a population where there was only about a million Jews there to where there's 10 million now, nearly, well, there's nearly 11 million people there, and 9 million of them are Jews. That's more than half of the Jews in the world. 17 million Jews, roughly, give or take a few in the world. So now they have a majority. And as I've said many times, if I were Jewish, I'd be in Israel. It's the only place that you can be safe. They'll fight for you there. They'll protect you there. They won't protect you in Milwaukee. They won't protect you in Dallas, Texas. They won't protect you in New York City but, or on a co any college campus. But they'll protect you in Israel, by golly. If I was a Jew, I would never, I would go to Israel and I'd never leave the country because I'd be afraid somebody would put me in a camp or kill me. Now, that's why the Jews are going home. And it's gonna get even, kind of gonna become even a bigger deal if we get closer to the rapture of the church. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. They are right now. The second strongest military in the world, because of their advanced technology and their advanced equipment. You know, I think the only people in the world who could defeat Israel right now would be the United States or China. And I would wonder about that because they have something that America and China doesn't have. They got God. We saw the hand of God last month when, when the Iranians sent that rocket, drone, and missile barrage against Israel. More than 300 airborne craft. God's hand just put it down there and they only had one death. Somebody, a kid that got killed and fallen debris and fire. Even some of Israel's enemies popped up to help them. Can you believe that? Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Of course, Jordan has had a treaty with Israel over several matters, but, you know, Jordan is always on the side of the Palestinians. Well, they weren't in this case. With thee will I break in pieces the nations. Well, that hadn't happened yet. With thee I will destroy kingdoms. That hadn't happened yet. With thee I will break in pieces the horse and the rider. And with thee I will break in pieces the chariots and his rider. That hadn't happened yet. With thee also I will break in pieces man and woman. With thee I will break in pieces young and old. And with thee I will break in pieces the young man and the maid. That has not happened yet. I will also break in pieces with thee, the shepherd and his flock. With thee I will break in pieces the husbandman and his yoke of oxen. And with thee I will break in pieces captains and rulers. Babylon hadn't been destroyed like that. And Israel has not been involved. 
But what you will come to see as we read these chapters that this destruction is not carried out by Israel, but is carried out by the God of Israel. When he returns, the head of the army of the host of heavens, followed by his saints, mounted on horses and dressed in fine white linen, which is the raiment of the saints, that we fall on the Son of God, whose vesture is bloody, and his name is the Word of God. And he destroys these armies gathered against him with a sword which proceedeth out of his mouth, which is the Word of God. Now it won't be Israel that takes his vengeance on Israel's enemies. In the very end, it will be the God of Israel who takes revenge and vengeance in what he calls here the day of visitation. That day has not come yet. It's coming. Could be as near as seven years from today. If the rapture happens today, it could be seven years from now. I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all the evil they have done in Zion. In your sight, saith the Lord, well, that certainly didn't happen. It didn't happen to the Babylon. It didn't happen to the Chaldeans. It didn't happen to their Assyrian forebearers. It did not happen to the Medes. It did not happen to the Persians who occupied Babylon. It did not happen to Alexander the Great and the Medo Greek and the <coughs> Macedonian Grecian Empire that he founded there, whose capital was Babylon. It didn't happen to them. It hasn't happened yet. It is going to happen. It is going to happen. Oh, well, it's just gone right along till we've gotten to here. I love you. Chapter 51 is a long chapter. We will continue tomorrow. The Lord be with you.